Hello, my name is Jeffrey Flory. Uh, I'm an associate professor at, uh, of economics at Claremont McKenna College. Uh, and I'm also the uh, uh, co-founder and research director at the Science of Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. Uh, I've been doing uh, field experiments, I guess, for about 13, uh, 12 to 15 years, somewhere in there, uh, since, since, since working on my PhD and then um, uh, in my years as a professor. Uh, and I started out initially in the areas of uh, looking at development economics and uh, poverty in, in poor countries and um, doing a lot of my dissertation work in Malawi and Sub-Saharan Africa, but then branched out and started looking at questions of diversity uh, in economics, the economics of diversity, starting with gender, and then over the last six to seven years, moving into the space also looking at race diversity and other types of demographic diversity or social identity diversity. Uh, and its relationships with uh, questions of economic importance. Uh, so in, in doing that, in the last um, five to six years, I started and have been growing this, uh, this initiative or this NGO, the Science of Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, that's a collaboration of uh, practitioners, uh, largely corporate practitioners, so large companies uh, like uh, Google and uh, BlackRock and, uh, and Walmart and other very large companies. Uh, as well as some uh, NGOs and um, governmental organizations with researchers who do, in particular, with uh, ex uh, economists uh, and a lot of field experimentalists, but also uh, social, um, social, social psychologists and organizational behaviorists to, do, to build a, a more rigorous foundation for questions around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion when we're talking about race or gender or ethnicity or age or any type of social identity uh, that we think might have a, a bearing on economic outcomes. And a lot of this is focused on uh, the workplace uh, and how different employees, for example, of different social identities interact with each other, uh, as well as how to um, get a good, uh, a good mix uh, with, for what the firm would like in terms of attracting, attracting uh, workers from different uh, underrepresented backgrounds and high-skilled workers because a lot of the U.S. economy has been very focused on this, increasingly so over the last five to ten years. There are questions about how to do this, how to get workers in the door, how to help them uh, succeed when they're in the door, but also what are the economic ramifications for the firm and also um, you know, markets and society at large as well. Uh, what are the costs and benefits involved in this? And, uh, how do we minimize any costs that might be involved? Uh, and how do we uh, maximize the benefits? Uh, and so I'm, um, I'm down here visiting uh, Gile at USEMA for, um, uh, for the month of August. And today I presented a paper that is actually um, initially premised on the US economy but actually could, uh, could work in many different economies around the world, which is uh, looking to dramatically expand the empirical basis uh, for understanding the impacts of social identity diversity, race, gender, age, socioeconomic status, the, the diversity in work teams on work production outcomes and on communication styles within work teams, or a whole host of communication variables and how that's related to production outcomes of teams when they're working in the workplace. Um, and so I was presenting that today. It was an excellent seminar. I got a lot of, a lot of feedback uh, and a lot of questions. And so this was the first time that I was able to actually present this, this study. And after the seminar, we had a, a really great discussion about different ways that I could think about uh, fielding this experiment not only in the US, but also potentially in Argentina and, and several other countries in Latin America to help unpack some of the different, uh, different drivers for why social identity can affect the ways that we communicate uh, in the workplace and the ways that we work together in the, com uh, in the workplace in ways that uh, enhance our productivity and diminish our productivity. Uh, to give you just a couple examples, uh, so um, race and ethnicity is, is top of mind for a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, in my conversations so far since I've been here uh, in, in Argentina and with, with folks at Chile, it's not the most salient social identity from a lot of people's perspectives. Uh, 
Uh, folks instead, for example, here talk a lot about nas uh, origin, national origin, uh, for example, maybe not immigration status, but rather uh, what country people have recently immigrated from and how that can be a pretty important uh, social identity that can influence the way that people interact with each other. So it may not be so much blacks and whites as in the US, um, but, or, or men and women, but it might be folks from Bolivia um, uh, as compared to folks from Argentina or folks from Peru. Uh, so, that's, so I've been thinking a lot about how to expand this project uh, into, into Argentina, uh, but also other countries within Latin America. Uh, but so that's one, that's one area of what I've been doing and what I am doing, uh, what I've been doing over the last month and what I, will, what I plan to do going forward. I think another way of characterizing what I'm doing here and my plans for the future and how it influences my plans for the future is I'm trying to develop a longer term relationship uh, with, with Chile and potentially a relationship between Saudi, the organization that I, I founded and helped run, uh, the Science and Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, which focuses on the economic questions around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Chile, right? And thinking more broadly about how the questions and ways of addressing uh, social identity diversity in the economy in the US, and in particular in workplaces and labor markets, how they can be um, implemented in Latin America and thinking about uh, not only for, from two different perspectives. On the one hand, to think about how they can be of benefit to understanding the dynamics and the frictions and, uh, and the benefits um, uh, and to make things more efficient and maximize value within different Latin American economies and labor markets and workplaces, to do that on the one hand, but then also at the same time to use um, a variety of cultural or economic environments in moving from the US to moving, for example, to Argentina, to moving to example, uh, Brazil, and thinking about the different types of uh, diversity that exists, whether it's race, socioeconomic class, or gender, and how different types of identity are correlated in different ways across these countries. So for example, in the US, there is often a lot of correlation between socioeconomic status and race or ethnicity, which seems to be less the case, for example, in Argentina, uh, I'm learning, um, which might actually help us tease out some of the uh, causal mechanisms a little bit better for what is driving any, um, any frictions and any benefits from interacting across diversity right? you, uh, with different types of people. Uh, Another question that I'm, I'm working on, uh, for example, I've been, I've been talking a lot about this with uh, Wenjido, the postdoc here right now, um, who's a postdoctoral scholar here at, at Chile, is this, the, the question of the ability to signal social identity and the economic ramifications of this. And what I mean by this is uh, the word that, that often comes to mind in the US is passing, right? So uh, in the context of race, it might be if, if you self-identify or come from one race or ethnicity, but, you, but it's ambiguous to other people what your race or ethnicity is, can you pass as a different race or ethnicity? So in the US context, often it's um, talked about in terms of passing as white, uh, and there's a, there's, a, you know, a historical, there's a history of that uh, at various different times in the US different ethnicities, uh, um, uh, there being perhaps an economic incentive to do that. Uh, and, and various uh, challenges or ease with which one can do that. One thing that's really uh, piqued my attention in, since coming to Chile is that uh, is thinking about the way that race operates differently in many countries in Latin America, whether it's Argentina or in Brazil uh, or in, uh, in Ecuador. Uh, or Bolivia or Colombia. So Brazil is an interesting example to compare again, uh, with the US because there's a very large um, Afro-descendant population, I think is the way that um, it's described in the literature. But there's a, there's a large population of folks that, that have some, um, some genealogical ancestry that is uh, descended from uh, folks initially from Africa, right? which is very much the case also in the US. But the way that race and ethnicity 
operates in Brazil is quite different than in the US. And so far as I understand, uh, I'm given to understand that there's a lot more ambiguity and there's more scope for signaling your race uh, to somebody you're interacting with uh, for different reasons. Uh, and there's so I'm still in the process of understanding this literature better, but I've found a couple of papers. There's some good economic papers on this and there's some good anecdotal evidence and even some, some news uh, stories done on this that at different point, uh, within Brazil, at different points in time, there were people, re in recent time, there are folks that uh, intentionally would signal that they were black, um, but where the people that they were talking to doubted it, uh, and, and vice versa, right? And so there are um, economic gains to be made from doing this in some situations. There are also economic costs, right? Um, now, I want to be careful in saying this because uh, it's not clear that somebody is one thing or another, right? So I can self, and so when we talk about social identity, what we, what we often are thinking about is how other people see us and how we see ourselves. But I'm really interested in this question about when there are opportunities, when there, when there is an opportunity to signal one type of identity versus another. In the US, for a lot of race and ethnicity questions, it's much more challenging, at least for black and white, as I understand it, compared to Brazil. So I'm really interested in seeing, in using this difference across the two countries to understand the economics of identity signaling. There are other types of identity signaling you could think of though too, which is socioeconomic status, right? Are there pros and cons, and what are they, um, for signaling your, uh, your affiliation with, with one group or another? Um, and there's another thought that I had uh, with related to that. Ah, yes, another, another um, question, a, a sort of a second order question that may actually, well, a second stage question about that, which may be actually of first order importance, is when you are operating in environments uh, where others know that you can signal uh, your identity, whether it's your racial identity, your ethnic identity, um, uh, your gender, uh, that's certainly possible, um, your age, your socioeconomic status. What does that do? Is there a game theoretic perspective, right? So, and, and, and what are the implications of that? And what are the spillover effects of that? So I'd really like to um, think about um, setting up a, a, a broad project of field experiments uh, in the US, in Brazil. I've also talked about parts of Argentina where there are larger uh, indigenous populations, and in other countries uh, where the, there's more ambiguity over uh, whether or not one is indigenous. Right? So I, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that uh, signaling whether you, you identify as indigenous or non-indigenous, especially when there are you know, countries in Latin America with high mestizo populations, um, that you can do that by the way that you dress and, and present yourself, that it's not so much um, looking at the color of your skin or something like that, but how you, but you can, that you have more uh, agency over how you're going to represent your ethnicity. And so um, these are, these are, this is a broader project that I'm, that I'm working on while here. And I'm, and I, and I suppose uh, the third thing I think I would mention just in terms of um, what I'm doing here uh, in, in my time is just looking for additional opportunities for, uh, for crossovers in, in this, the economics of diversity, if you want to call it that, or you could call it the economics of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and, uh, and opportunities to build our knowledge about the economics of diversity more generally in the science, wherever it is in the world, but also uh, for the benefit of different countries in Latin America on multiple questions of, of diversity and seeing how uh, SODI, the Science of Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, can interact with Chile to, to help push this forward so that SODI is not just pushing this uh, field forward in the U.S., but is doing it um, uh, also throughout the Americas.